speech or your presentation. At first, I have a quite a specific question, which is uh, quite a hot topic at the moment, and that is the concept of terrorism. Um, well, I was wondering how you feel about um, the international community trying to define what is terrorism uh, in order to um, uh, see and to identify acts of terrorism and acts of counter-terrorism. Mm -hmm. I was wondering what your views on this are. Terrific question, because it really is directly relevant to what I said. It's embarrassing not to have a quick answer. I don't have a quick answer to that question. It's a very fair question, a very relevant question. Um, one of the first reactions, it seems to be more like the corruption example than the prison rules example. A highly contested concept. The fact that it's being used so much doesn't mean that it's actually fitting or working and so on. But more like things like finish with genocide, democracy, that people use to hit each other with without it actually creating this sort of mining, you know, world of scholars all agreeing what they actually mean by something so that they can then go about improving it. It's perhaps an idealized, uh, almost te technocratic vision of the world, but um, the scholars, some of them, we've brought into that by reading and writing and communicating with each other. We must hope that some, there's some role for ideas in making the world a better place. Could academics, therefore, to reformulate your question, not as it's presently used, terrorism in the world by people, where it's clearly used to justify what people want to do, could academics, following Twining's advice, sit down and sort it out? <laughs> this is really the question, isn't it? That's the question I've been discussing. Is it something that can be sorted out by academics, and is that an important job for them? And then the next question would then be listeners. Common point for academics. Sometimes it's a good thing that they listen to us, sometimes it's a pity. But um, is it something which we could even successfully tackle? Well, some people do. Uh, Clifford Geerty, a leading thinker in London University, has written a book on about terrorism, which he certainly goes quite away from the standard politicised view of the term, you know, being our enemies are terrorists, where in a, you know, state terrorism is clearly part of the uh, universal vocabulary which already is being used by critical authors if never used by representatives of states themselves. So one could, no doubt, at the end of the day, conceptually try to bring down what we meant by terrorism. But the question which Twining uh, also raises about corruption is the, the, the emotive work that terms like that do that the condemnation is in the word, you know. If you would use a different, not terrorism, you know, just a descriptive, this, this, this happening this sort of way, you have nothing that to say emotional impact. So by saying terrorism, you are really wanting to say this is a particularly bad thing, a particularly frightening thing. Um, that is going to be difficult to, as it were, <clears throat> sterilize in academic debate, because if you take it out of the term, then you haven't got the same term anymore. And if you leave it in the term, then of course, what is totally shocking and frightening for one group, from one point of view, is, is you know, I mean, the Holocaust may not have been terrorism, but it might have been far worse. You know, it was done in a terrorist way, but in a systematic, bureaucratic way. So, quite, you know, what the emotional weight of these terms uh, is, and what the academics should do about it, is very much a question. So, I don't have at all a definition of terrorism which would answer, which I suspect lies behind your question, the problem of getting able to agree what terrorism is and what terrorism isn't. But I suspect that what Twining is talking about is exactly about that sort of problem, so you're right to raise it. Anyone else? A question? Yes. Thank you for your question. This is how possible to describe concepts and comparison with other concepts in time, like ter terrorism, is it now different than before? Because the change of the uh, revolution in France, the meaning, and probably our concept of terrorism is based on our previous conceptions, but our conceptions not always 
based on what is not. What is what? What is not. Uh, terrorism is not. And the eco culture is our eco culture different than the other eco culture, so that's what makes our eco culture some inherent other values. I mean, on the first point, you can tell the history of the concept. And there are wonderful books which do just that. Raymond Williams wrote a book called Keywords, which uh, takes, you know, culture is the most complicated word in terms of history. You need to study different things. But you can take a term, you know, sort of interesting exercise to see how it's changed its meaning. Uh, I suspect that's not sufficient for what both Twining and the last question were worrying about, which is to allow us to be talking about important problems in the world with a common vocabulary, merely to show how we've got to where we are now, particularly <coughs> if, if the term has a number of different meanings, all you can do is show how we've ended up here. It doesn't answer the problem where to go from there. It's a sort of search for us with moral Esperanto that Twining's involved in, isn't it? Sort of where we have a universal moral language. I don't know how much is possible. I don't think one could just dismiss it because so many of the things we're engaged in, not least human rights, is already trying to do that. And um, it seems a little colonialist if you say, and we have to apply to ourselves as well, these things, not just to others. Um, so, the, and in the globalizing world, more and more there is isn't to change, and more and more there is some sort of pressure towards these yardsticks, these measurements, of how or where do we stand, the rest of them, we must improve, we must do better. And so the, the, the moving towards common yardsticks is coming about. It doesn't always have to do with what is currently true. South Africa, when it introduced a new constitution, did not say, ah, we must make our constitution like conditions in Africa. So let's go and look at the places most like our South African countries. Of course, it's very opposite. No, we want as little as possible to do with other African countries. We want the best, most develop an idea of what a good constitution should be in the abstract. So, you know, as a matter of actual practice, whether it's possible or not, in that people are trying to do this impossible thing. So, scholars are, as often happens, sometimes running behind what's really changing the real world, not necessarily going too far ahead of it. And yes, if you have international tribunals dealing with terrorism, then they will have to define it. The question whether they're doing a good or a bad job, and how you decide, how would you know whether they're doing a good or a bad job, whether and that's interesting too because one of the things I didn't mention is regarding the concept of traveling well that the difficulty of the metaphor is also that increasingly um, what we have with international institutions is not as in the old transplant story, something moving from one country to another country, you know, what happens to it, you know. But we have um, an institution which is transnational yes, better than others would know, because it's most of the base here, <laughs> which, which tries to, with the same terminology, apply to many different places. It's a bit of a different, and the metaphor of one travelling you know, is even less helpful there when you're talking about that. So yes, it's, it's, a, it's a really good... By the way, in terms of... Um, another thing I forgot to mention, I'll throw in now, because it's important, uh, I can't remember all the things I was talking. The, the, at one point, Twining was very modest uh, about how far he's got. He says, if you ask me why prison rules travel better than corruption, I don't know. I don't have a competence to judge. But I think it's like this. I think it's as a result of diffusion. Diffusion is part of this legal transplant thing. You know, it's about how the things move around. Culture diffuses, policies diffuse. You know. Uh, as soon as my local government decided they could charge people parking charges in the street, everywhere in the world, the sort of next week was doing it, diffusing very quickly. Like that. Um, so he says, I think that prison rules diffused out from America. The prison as an institution is American, and then these practices of prison officers, you know, being bound to certain managerial standards. So I think that it's a lot to do with the fact that it's generally applicable is because it travels well is because it was based on the original model. And that, as it is true, is very paradoxical, if it's true. Because you're actually saying what travels best is what was always local. Um, and it's not necessarily right, apart from being paradoxical, because a Lawrence Friedman, an important name in the discussion of globalizing law, Lawrence Friedman 
takes the example of ombudsman and says, actually, ombudsman travels well. It's not part of Twining's debate, but he's talking about traveling well in his own language. Ombudsman, everybody's taking up the idea of ombudsman, and nobody remembers or cares what it actually meant, what it actually does in the Scandinavian country from which it was first taken. So the success of ombudsman seems to be unconnected with where it came from. The success of prison rules for finding has to do everything with where it first came from. So very much there's work to be done here, combined analytical and empirical work to be done on, on seeing what sense it makes to try and answer the questions of the general concept of the possible, the visible, and why they become general. So that, as I did at the end of the talk, a bit moving the issue from that they, we can pick them out to let's look at who's making them go general. It, it's still an interesting inquiry because the answer is not always to be taken for granted. The prison rules and ombudsman seem to be different stories. Okay. Yes. Um, well, I was thinking about what you said that globalization leads to more uh, universal, uh, universal um, interpretation of certain concepts and that we all grow together uh, in the interpretation of certain uh, terms. But isn't it so that the only thing uh, globalization really showed us that the more we learn about other cultures and about other values, the more people uh, want to stick to their own values and to their own culture and so to their own terms. Because if you if you look at uh, new um, um, uh, cultures like Dubai or China, they all learn our Western society and they, they uh, learn our our concepts and our terms and they say, well, uh, we, we understand but we stick to our own culture and we, we think your culture is wrong. So isn't globalization exactly the wrong way to um, to, to, to get to a universal um, interpretation of certain terms and concepts? Yes, that's a very good question. Um, I'm sure you're right that um, globalization should not be taken to be the same thing as harmonization, as, as the word we're more similar. Mm -hmm. Although many people talk about that, conversions, various things. I, I don't think globalization does mean conversions. Certainly Dubai would be more similar in many ways than it was before, you know, institutionally, it's buildings, it's technology, so on the economic system, but still very different and even more want to be different on other fronts. So yes, I think that globalization uh, needs a differentiation to place people different as much as to uh, grow similarity. But that's the nature of all um, economic uh, social development. The modern society that Durkheim described for us was a world where things became more different as well as more similar. The idea that things become more similar is wrong because Grown division of labour requires difference. You know? So in a globalising world, if all societies specialise, they're going to be doing different things, not just the same things, apart from the more obvious but not less important idea that we're Islamic or not, sort of yeah. resistance. I think that the result of getting to know about other places can lead to you wanting to um, accentuate your differences, not to want to be general, as you say. So people think themselves, we don't have crap and punch. America does. That helps us define who we are. We are the people who don't have capital punishment. And that's an example of what you're saying. But there's a counterexample as well. When Finland, which used to have the highest number of people in prison in Europe, discovered that as compared to Scandinavia and then more generally to Europe, um, it was on the high side, they didn't want that. They pushed it down. And the Netherlands, Partly when he discovered the low side felt justified in, in going up. So the awareness of what other places are doing and the uh, desire to sort of move to some sort of average, normative has a double sense. And normative, it means right, but also can be normal. Just as individuals, so to groups or states, it's going to be normal, you know, it's going to be in the average. And this process through globalization, as much more than before, we get to know what other places do. Tend us to want to be more like them. Sometimes that's imposed, you know, the conditionalities that the European Union puts on Eastern Europe and candidate countries that have to be like us and a whole set of parameters. Sometimes it's imposed, sometimes it's through imitation, the way in which most cultural change takes place. We want to be more like them. Sometimes there's resistance, as you're saying, but it's all of those things together. 
And I think it's unrelevant what you say, because then one would expect this would have some implications for general concepts, but quite what they are <laughs> at this point, I don't know. But I think it would be worth pursuing that, it would be a very interesting thing to pursue. Anyone else has a question? I have one. Chairman, just kick himself back. I want my benefits as well. Um, when we talk about these traveling concepts, I sometimes have the idea that there is no reciprocity in traveling concepts. That it's it's either imposed yeah. or it is important. Without when it's important, I can't see the motive why it's important. If it is imposed, I can see it. But what seems to me is that the concepts that do travel well, or not, as the case may be, are more imposed and have something in common as in that they actually do come from our frame of reference, from the Western style of doing things. And when we look at the economy and how the market economy has spread around the world, it seems to me that market economy is an organizing principle that seems to work because it gives people wealth. It takes people Until out. last year. Until last year. <laughs> Hopefully, we will pick up again from it. It's a little bit. It needs to be reorganized. But it seems to be an organizing principle that, for some reason, can claim some kind of universal or global uh, uh, ground. And, and that, that is an important aspect in why concepts could travel. Uh, whereas we don't see concepts travel that come from a, a, a cultural background, a cultural context to which we do not relate at all. We don't, we don't, we within Western Europe say, we do not import concepts from other cultures. It always seems to go the other way around. Or within, it's just something I'm, I'm struggling with. How we have to perceive the, the, the where it comes to come from. I think that's the basic question. Yes. I mean, it proves your point, but there, there was some importation from Japan of uh, ways of doing things when we thought they were better economics than we were. So it wasn't always one of the ways, but it proves your point that the reason for it was the economic success that was associated with Japan at that time. But it's peculiar this process of you know the process of how things spread, which isn't exactly what Twain is talking about, though which is obviously not that connected. Because American things spread even when often people don't like America or they think themselves are seen as having been failures. You know, they just sort of spread because they spread. I mean, uh, why should the American criminal process be so influential around the world? It's part of that great mess which is the American criminal justice system, which is a sort of open sore on society. <laughs> But, you know, there are ways of doing things apparently, you know, they're lawyers and they're, you know, all, all, you know, the things the best game in town. Italy's changed its criminal procedural system to try and be more like America. You know, so, is that just because it's the economically successful country? I would to expect then everything Chinese would become popular soon. I think so. so, I think a lot of the English in this language, you know, films and things like that. But the, the, that takes us into um, the wider question of how things spread. I think that Twining was trying to raise a, a, a connected but slightly separate issue. I don't know how successful he is, a separate issue, which is not, as I said, being not about um, when are transplants legal or otherwise uh, successful and why, why they come from a certain place and not others. Um, but Rather, in these sort of cross-cultural yardsticks, where we are judging others and deciding what in the world bank has to make some tough decisions every day, and doesn't have the basis not just of economically how well they are, but how they're doing all these other sets of governance and legal whole set of issues. So that people are making very important consequential decisions for life and death on the basis also of these indicators. Is there any way we can make these indicators? Uh, satisfactory, what's the job that's that partly conceptual, only but it's partly conceptual, 
what's the job for those of us who work with ideas to try and make <coughs> such indicators more sensible? And I started off somewhat skeptically by giving an example of judicial independence, which again is used regularly by the world value, to, to point out that it could be a tricky term, more tricky term to use than, than it seems to be assumed by those who compile this answer to have to push it for rather lower than I think it should be. So I, I'm, I'm sort of even more than twining, uh, perhaps, uh, see the problems of it. But I don't think the twining exercise was based on a sort of a easy assumption that, it, that there's, it's not a difficult thing to do. He, he, he thinks it is a difficult thing to do, but that academics who do legal theory have this as one of their jobs. If other people, other institutions in the world are having to, to talk about standards in a global environment, then somebody has to be helping to see whether that talk makes sense. That's his argument. Uh, following from there as a final comment, would it be possible to envisage uh, development of truly global norms? Like, well, this, the whole exercise in our investigation into well-traveling concepts, or these concepts that have a very wide appeal to a variety of people, peoples, uh, would it be possible to rise to light from that and say, well, in these areas, circumscribed in, in a particular way, you could actually generate certain norms that are truly global, and could, in that sense, be Consolidate the some kind of legal rule. Well, you know, you know better than I do. The, the, the first progress in that is, is made regarding the problem of the environment because that affects everybody, and therefore we are trying to do something about it. If you read the sociological books about the environment, you'll find that they uh, point out very quickly that what seems to be a shared problem, which nobody should have the same concern about, is actually, from a social scientist's point of view, anything but a shared problem. Who pays the price for reducing you know, things? And at what stage? A country that have never been through the industrialization that we've had, should they really have to abide by the same restrictions on pollution when they haven't had the benefits of first going through that stage? So problems which appear to be global and require global solutions, they have global concepts. Uh, and what's happened to the environment is sort of the, the, the knockdown case. Uh, being less culturally a problem about different you know, religious views about uh, human beings, uh, priorities, or problems of terrorism. The environment the under our feet is, <laughs> is in trouble, our scap is melting, sort of thing. Even that has some serious difficulties about deciding um, the sort of issue that Twining raised about, you know, does the prisoner in a poor country have a right to water? So there are, there are some normative questions there, sort of living aside, you know, will it happen, won't it happen, could it happen? I think, I think the, 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 the legal theorist's job is limited, I think it has a limited role, and the role would be insofar as in that area most of us would agree it ought to happen. We ought to get a grip on what's happening at a global, because we don't do it globally, it can't be done. This is just not something you can do, nation to nation state. The global problems transcend it and stuff wafts over from here to there, Chernobyl affects us here, but they do that, affects us there. That's what globalization means, the butterfly effect. Nobody is apart. So you need to have a global response. Do you need to have global concepts about you know, what is good and bad and dealing with it? Probably, yes, some global concepts would be wrong. And therefore, again, the sort of exercise that Twine is inviting us to participate in must be important. Thank you. I think, well, it's a moment for questions. Could handle this note. I thank you.